Silent Hill Origins, the first non-team silent game in the series. It would act as an ode to the previous games while trying to incorporate some new elements. While being the first non-team silent game, it was also the first western developed Silent Hill game. Would western studios be able to hold a candle to the previous four games in the series? Let's just say everything is going to be different from here on out. We've talked about four fantastic games, even if one of them wasn't all the way up to snuff. It was still in that league, that upper echelon. Now, we're in a different tier. Today, we're going to be taking a comprehensive look at Silent Hill Origins. We'll be talking about gameplay, mechanics, story, and everything in between. If you haven't seen my previous videos on the Silent Hill series, it would benefit you to go watch them before getting into this. I won't be talking about them in depth here, but Silent Hill Origins takes a lot from those games and it would make more sense thematically. Spoiler warning for Silent Hill Origins and Silent Hill 1. Hey dad, it's me, your favorite son, and today I want to talk about Silent Hill Origins. After the release of Silent Hill 4, Konami wanted to move from in-house development on Silent Hill titles and shift to Western developers. The company didn't like how the games looked and wanted to shift style and story to something else. Konami went with Climax Studios to develop the newest entry in the series. Climax had many subsidiaries at the time, though the company overall had lots of experience with ports and licensed contents. Great genre-breaking hits like Lizzie McGuire 3 Homecoming Havoc, Power Rangers Time Force, and Krusty Demons. Origins was first announced and shown off at E3 in 2006. In this state, the game had a over-the-shoulder camera, more akin to something like Resident Evil 4, and the main character had a laser sight on his gun, as well as the ability to barricade areas. Origins was originally expected to be released in late 2006, but when the vision for the game didn't line up at Climax's high level, the Los Angeles studio was shut down. The development was then transferred to the Climax Action Studio in the United Kingdom. The game was pushed back to the end of 2007 to ensure the new vision could be realized. The UK studio received the LA studio's version of Origins, which was apparently meant to be a dark comedy inspired by the TV show Scrubs. Konami was fine with the studio changing the game, as long as it could be completed in the same time frame and with the same budget. Sam Barlow had to redo the script, level design, and monsters within one week. The developers tried to intentionally replicate the gameplay and atmosphere from the first game. When the new version was playable, IGN remarked, Portable scary done right? Looks like it, in their GC 2006 article. Akira Yamaoka was the only member of the original team that would return to work on Origins. He composed the score for Origins and he tried to imbue the music with the atmosphere of the first game. Let's get into the game and see if Climax could save it. Silent Hill Origins released on November 6, 2007 for the PSP and was ported to the PlayStation 2 on March 4, 2008. Before we get into the meat of things, I want to say that I ended up playing Silent Hill Origins on the PSP emulator, PPSSPP. I originally tried to emulate the PlayStation 2 version, which serves as a significant graphical upgrade for the game. This didn't go so well as about 15 minutes into my playthrough, I got all manner of graphical glitches that made the game virtually unplayable. The PSP version did also have its fair share of graphical glitches, but they only came about halfway through the game and weren't nearly as bad. The PSP version also has the advantage of a brightness slider, which is pretty necessary for this incredibly dark game. 
Also, I want to give the obligatory Silent Hill story explanation here. If you haven't seen my previous videos on Silent Hill, which you should, I'll be going over the story throughout the course of the video. This will be a surface level interpretation of the story as most of Silent Hill's stories are hidden beneath the surface. At the end, before the final thoughts, I'll go back through and explain what really happened in the game. Origins takes place before the events of Silent Hill, as we'll see shortly. Silent Hill Origins begins with a conversation over a CV radio, our new main character Travis Grady telling another trucker about taking a shortcut through Silent Hill. As Travis approaches the town in his truck, he sees flashes of himself as a child and skids out as someone steps in front of his truck. As he gets out, the fog surrounds him and Travis sees something in his side mirror. Suddenly, a girl appears and runs off. I think you know who that is, Alessa Gillespie. This game doesn't take long to get into the events of Silent Hill, and the whole thing tries to tie into the first game, acting as a true prequel. Travis heads toward the town on foot and finds a burning building. He runs inside to rescue survivors and finds a girl in the center of a symbol and some candles. She's entirely burned, and he grabs her, trying to save her from the fire. As the two of them escape the building, walls of flame begin to disappear, symbols appearing in the middle of them. My first complaint with this game is the animations. I don't really enjoy the art style in general, as it's a little cartoony for my taste, but the animations are just odd. When Travis falls through the floor, the movements remind me of Bugs Bunny. It's just so odd and tonally different from what we're seeing. Travis gets the girl out of the building and tries to yell for help before he hears sirens and passes out. Hey, someone help her. Where is everyone? He wakes up on a bench inside of Silent Hill, asking himself the same thing I ask myself when I've had one too many paps alone at my computer. What happened last night? He goes to check on Alessa at the hospital and we're given control. I hope I'm not bursting your bubble when I say that, yes, the burned girl we saw was Alessa. We'll get to all that in a bit, though. Silent Hill Origins is, at its core, a love letter to the original Silent Hill. The town map, which changes drastically with each entry in the series, is much closer to the first game. Our first destination is Alcamilla Hospital, the area from the original game. We have that familiar camera view from the first game, and playing this on the PSP with its toned-down graphics feels almost just like the original. But it's just as much a love letter to Silent Hill 2 and 3 as it is the first game. It's throwing elements from every game into one mashed pot, while also trying its own new thing. This affects the game in a way that I'm not really a huge fan of, but we'll get there. Travis enters Alcamilla Hospital in search of Alessa. Inside, he finds a note detailing the construction on the second and third floors of the hospital. Travis runs into the hospital director, Dr. Kaufman, a character featured in the first game. A girl? We've received no new patients in the last day or so. Was she hurt? She was burned all over. Are you a relative? What did you say her name was? I don't know her name. I was the one who saved her from the fire. She must have been brought here. Is there another hospital? I'm sorry, perhaps someone in reception could help you. We step inside the elevator and head to the second floor. Here, we get our first weapon and our first taste of combat. We start with only a radio and a lucky quarter. Most of the controls thus far have been pretty similar to the first game. This was intentional as the developers wanted it to feel like that classic. The combat is also mostly the same, but with a few modernized changes, or at least modern for 2007. The fighting is a little more action-y, we get a second upswing when using melee weapons. There's also the addition of quick time events when getting grasped. I don't love the QTEs as they pull me out of the game a little bit, but I don't mind the combat overall. It's a little more fluid and I feel like it improves on the weak points the series previously had. The wooden hacking at enemies always felt a little dated, even though it was a staple. My complaint still lies that the animations look a little cartoonish, though. We, of course, also get ranged weapons in this entry, of which there are a lot. 
These haven't really been changed. Aim and shoot till the enemy goes down. There are a lot of weapons in this game overall though. Hammers, pieces of wood, crates, typewriters. Travis can use anything and everything as an improvised device for smashing. The only problem with this is that every weapon in the game is breakable, and most of them break pretty quickly. This forces the player to have to go back to the menus mid-combat to switch to another weapon, again forcing them out of the action into the gaudy menu UI, using it as an improvised breathing room. This change was unnecessary in my mind, artificially inflating the amount of weapons in the game and balancing it by just having them all break is odd. I'd rather have six items that have their own distinct purposes than 30 that function exactly the same and break after six swings. Travis fights his way through a nurse, another return from the previous entries in the series, and finds a room with a large mirror. As he's heading out, he sees Alessa again in the mirror. She puts a red handprint on it, and when Travis touches it, he's transported to the other world. This is this game's big new mechanic, the mirror system. We'll find multiple mirrors throughout each level of the game, and we can use them to transport ourselves into the other world. Things in the other world are different, of course. Steel grating, rusty walls, blood-covered floors, you know, the things we've come to expect from a Silent Hill game. But new rooms will be unlocked or items will appear in special places that they weren't in the normal world. So the mirrors become vital for retrieving items and solving puzzles, even just making our way around an area. The mirror idea is one that I can see making sense during development, and especially in the grand scheme of things. But ultimately, I don't think it works the way that the team wanted it to. At the very least, I think it sacrifices horror for the reward of the new mechanic. Part of the true horror of the other world in the previous games is that the character was forced into it. They found themselves in a strange realm that was both terrifying and spooky. Getting the puzzles finished, completing the necessary components, and beating the boss was vital to get the heck out of there, because we didn't want to stick around for too long. Giving the player the ability to travel back and forth between these realms definitely lessens the effect of it. It's part of the larger problem that this game faces overall in that it's just not scary enough. Travis finds a golden egg in one of the hospital rooms and a note saying that her power has been contained and something must be hidden, protected. Our goal in the hospital is to collect five plastic organs. They're placed in different locations around the area, and we have to return them to this plastic dummy in the director's office. Travis uses the golden egg to gain access to the bathroom, and also finds the main memo we'll be using for this puzzle. It contains a mnemonic used to memorize the organs in the body and what order they go in. We travel back to the normal world and start to see writings on the walls, people's names, and a number beneath. Travis finds another note about the construction for the hospital. It seems they were under some serious budget constraints, but not enough to worry about the staff party. Dr. Kaufman seems to be hiding something because it's forbidden to enter his office unless accompanied. Travis finds another name and number on the wall, and this gives us our code to gain the final organ, which is locked in a cooler box in the other world. The memo tells us age comes before beauty, and we enter the lowest numbers first. With all the organs in tow, we can head to the plastic dummy and place the organs in line with the memo from before. With this, the dummy's eyes open and we retrieve them. We can travel to the other world and place the eyes in a door to gain access. Here. We get to the director's office and face our first boss, which isn't really a boss. It's one of the lying figures from Silent Hill 2, and we take him down pretty easily. This isn't a big deal because these will become common enemies pretty soon. One of the most annoying things that they do is hop onto Travis and attack. This gives us the opportunity to complete a QTE to get him off of us. For some reason, this would only work about 50% of the time, and I can't really be sure if this was a glitch or if it just required you to be really fast. When the lying figure is dead, a sigil appears in the center of the room, and there's a small triangular shape in the center. Travis picks it up and Alessa appears. 
What was that thing? This isn't happening. When he wakes up, a nurse is there to greet him, Lisa Garland. Lisa and Travis talk about the fire last night. Well, I'm done here. Name's Travis. Nice to meet you, Lisa. You sure you're okay? You look a little shaken up. Sorry. No, it's okay. To be honest, I've been a little off all day. I was in a fire last night. Lisa says no one knows how it was started and says that Alessa died in the hospital. I really don't like the implementation of these characters in this game. I understand that they were trying to make a prequel and likely wanted to clear up events from before the first entry, but boy, every one of these characters feels bungled and forced. It feels a little more like fan service than actually developing the characters further and extrapolating on them as people. While I'm complaining about things, I just want to quickly show this god-awful UI. Maybe this really is a personal thing, but boy this thing looks rough. It's kind of gross, and the whole file thing that they're going for is pretty grating on the eyes. Remember conveying tone and style with colors and geometry rather than just shoving a folder theme in your face and hoping it gets the point across? Travis heads to a butcher shop and finds a trail of blood leading through the back. Here we see our first appearance of the butcher. This is this game's pyramid head and is functionally the exact same character. He's going to sort of appear throughout the game in various ways, just like Pyramid Head did previously. We'll get more into the butcher later. Travis leaves the shop and heads to the sanitarium. This is an incredibly large building, and if I can give this game credit for one thing, it's that the areas are all very big. There's not as much info or interesting stuff packed into them as previous games, but it feels like there's a lot to explore. Travis finds a note that says some of the patients have swallowed the keys to certain areas in the building. We have to find them now, and Travis makes his way to the eastern wing of the building. He finds a note about one of the sanitarium's patients, a woman who has violent mood swings. She gets in frequent visits from her child and husband, but she's still aggressive. Travis encounters a woman in the hallway, Dahlia Gillespie. At the fire, I saw you there. Of course you did. That was my house, burning. My daughter, Alessa. You were the one who saved her. Yeah, she was your daughter? Why did you leave her? Why did no one help? You all left that girl to burn. So we did. The world is stranger than you think. Travis makes his way through the hospital, exploring its depths. He finds an iron lung, which, if you don't know, is a type of ventilator machine that assists breathing when the body cannot breathe on its own. It seems someone has died in the machinery, and the suspicion is that the machine must have broke. We can use the buttons to overload the pressure, which spits out a key. Making our way through the basement gains us access to some other areas of the building, and upstairs is a hydrotherapy room. I like that the developers used pretty outdated methods of treatment for mental illness. It makes the place seem barbaric and torturous to some extent. Hydrotherapy is no longer used for this type of treatment in the modern day, and iron lungs, though not a treatment for mental illness, are mostly obsolete. This game also takes place in the past, so it fits as well. We can flush one of the tubs, which has a key inside, down the drain, and get it downstairs. To do this, we have to make our way to the other world. Inside, Travis experiences a flashback of sorts. I've always hated you! You and your devil son! Oh god, Helen! My dear, dear Helen! You really are dead! What will I do? Heading back to the normal world, we see a strange message scrawled on the bathroom floor. Travis finds another memo about the patient from before. The notes detail the patient attacking her husband. She was sedated and taken back to her room. There's another note in Dr. Harris's office about the same patient whose name is still obscured. She's been having delusions about a mirror world, which we just so happen to be experiencing right now. 
Travis finds a shotgun barring the door when switching to the mirror world here and takes it. Aside from the nurses, two other enemies troll the halls of the sanitarium. The first is the carrion, which is a slinking enemy, supposedly a skinned cow which drags itself across the ground. I enjoy the design and I think it's effective, but man these guys are annoying. They have a lunge attack that has quite a bit of range and does a lot of damage. Another new enemy is the Remnant. This one is a less is more design, a floating harness whose true shape can only be seen when its shadow is cast on a wall. Another very interesting design. I think they mostly got it with the new monster design, though a few of the designs are just rehashes of old monsters, the new additions work effectively for the most part. Travis gets access to one of the storerooms and finds a note from an officer detailing his arrival at a house where the mother had turned on the gas and almost blew up the place. This seems to be the same woman we've been hearing about. Travis heads into the basement and finally retrieves that key that he flushed down the drains. This allows him to access the interview archives room. In here, there's another flashback type scene where a woman, nameless one from the memos, talks about her child. They saw the devil inside of him. I had to kill him. My responsibility. My flesh and blood. I brought him into this world, so I had to take him out of it. We head back to the other world and find a list of medications that will help us with our next puzzle. We have to match these medications up with five different patient rooms. Each of these patient rooms have distinguishing features, like knives or fire. These features can be matched up with these dolls, and we can then use the memo to determine what treatments each doll needs. Matching up the correct prescription will give us the key to Dr. Harris's office. Heading back to the normal world, we find a memo detailing an incident where a child snuck into the female seclusion ward. Travis enters Dr. Harris's office and finds the Jocasta artifact, which will let us into the female seclusion ward of the building. There's a memo on the desk talking about a patient arriving at the sanitarium. Her name was Helen Grady, Travis's mother. Outside on the floor, a child's drawing can be seen labeled Daddy, Mama, and Travis. The music here changes to a more jamming, melodic tune. As I said before, Akira Yamaoka returned to compose the music for Origins. The tracks here are pretty good, and I definitely can't complain too much about Yamaoka's music, but I do feel like the tracks aren't as in your face as they were in previous games. A lot of the tunes are more groovy beats rather than horrific arrangements. There's a lot of drums on the OST, and sometimes it just feels a little too held back for its own good. Travis travels to the other world and heads to the female seclusion ward with the Jocasta artifact. Graphical glitch warning, this area of the sanitarium was rife with glitches, so you might see some. Lisa is sitting at one of the doors and Travis asks if Alessa is inside. They can't do anything for her. She just sits there. She wants her boy so badly. Who are you talking about? Is the girl inside? Alessa, is Alessa in there? No. No! You know who's in there! Lisa runs away and we head into the room. Travis sees a flashback as he enters, finding his mother as a child. Helen Grady, Travis's mother, is our first boss battle. The boss battles in Origins are insanely easy, and coming off the back of Silent Hill 4, it's a cakewalk. We just load ammo into Helen while keeping our distance. She's a floating, bandaged woman surrounded by a plastic casing with spikes that she can project out of herself. We find another one of these triangles in this room, the past piece. The first one we found was the future piece, and if you haven't realized it by now, these are the pieces of the Flowros that we find in the first game. Alessa shows up again, and Travis asks her some questions, but she doesn't answer. Are you making this happen? Are you doing this? Wait, no. Don't go. I need to know. Instead, the sirens start and Travis again loses consciousness. He wakes up in the sanitarium, free of monsters now. Before he heads outside, he finds a ticket for the local theater on the ground. 
Outside, in the trunk of a running car, Travis finds the lumber yard key. This will gain us entrance further north in town. We have to weave through the lumber yard where we can hear the butcher lurking inside, and the Greenfield apartments. In the lumber yard, we find a note that someone has left Travis. Inside the apartment, someone is telling Travis to go home. One important thing we find is the mailbox for apartment 213. It's overflowing, but that'll be important much later. Travis drops his ticket at the box office of the theater, and it unlocks the doors. Inside, we find a memo detailing the costume of a character named Caliban. The note also references Valtiel, the demon from Silent Hill 3. The red highlighted words spell out Caliban has it in his cave. Lisa is in the theater, and she's being strange. I just love the theater, Travis. I want to be an actress. But mom was a nurse, and her mom was a nurse, so I'm going to be a nurse. I've got what it takes, though. I can't stop thinking about you, Travis. I want you. You're all I think about. Let's get the hell out of this crazy town. Run off. The two of us, we could be so good together. <laughs> See? I could be a star! As Lisa leaves, we head into the backstage, and there's an odd puppet hanging from the ceiling. Walking across the stage, Travis can hear a flashback of the play itself. Hang not on my garments. Sir, have pity. I'll be his shorty. Silence! One word more shall make me chide if not hate thee. What? An advocate for an impossible? Hush. How thick is there is no more such? You okay, Tony? Yes. Yes. Fine. Just a headache. One of the actors was getting nosebleeds during rehearsals. In the curtain control room, we find a note saying that the fuses are blown for the safety curtains, so we can't move the curtains right now. As we head further backstage, we encounter our first new theater enemy, the puppets. These things are very annoying as they will hang from the wall and saunter towards you. If they get close enough, they'll try to strangle Travis with their feet. This enters us into a QTE. They're also pretty fast when they're knocked off the ceiling and on their feet. One thing that permeates through every enemy in this game and is somehow more prominent with the puppets is finishing. In most Silent Hill games, you hit an enemy a few times, they're knocked down, and you can run up to them, hit X, and you'll finish the enemy off. Normally, if you don't do this, the enemy will just get up and come back at you. This is the same for Silent Hill Origins, but for some reason, about 50% of the time, I couldn't get the finisher to trigger. I'm not sure if you were supposed to get the enemy down a certain amount of times or what, but half the time it just wouldn't work, and with the puppets, half turned into 75%. I was beating my head against the wall trying to figure out how to kill these things. It was rough. Travis finds a service pistol in one of the backstage rooms and a play diary detailing the events of rehearsals. A girl snuck into the theater and happened to be there when the actor got his nosebleed. We find a note about the costumes for different characters, and some writing about Silent Hill being located on old spiritual ground. Travis uses the mirror to head to the other world and finds a key to the balcony. The other worlds in Silent Hill Origins are one of its strong points. The hospital especially reminds me a lot of Alcamilla from the first game. They do truly feel like horrific places, and the environments are perfectly portrayed, especially with the limitations of the PSP. The theater is no exception. It doesn't use this bright red environment that we're used to seeing. It's dark, and the walls are covered in vines, roots splayed across the ground, some type of rot permeating through the place. We head upstairs, and in the light control room, we can find four light bulbs. A note tells us that the light circuits are broken and gives us some clues as to how the bulbs should be placed. B is half of D, a and B can't exceed C, and D must not exceed A. Travis finds a moon totem and a sun totem, which in the other world can be placed beside a door to let us travel further upstairs. Traversing these halls, we'll be able to access the storage rooms. We can get a hunting rifle in the back by a totem. 
I haven't really gone into the intricacies of the weapons that we've received, primarily because they don't really make much of a difference. As I said before, combat can be particularly easy in this entry, and I didn't find much difference between using the hunting rifle, shotgun, or assault rifle, aside from slight damage output. In the costume storage, Travis finds a note written by someone having dreams about the butcher. On the catwalk, we find the light fixtures. Placing the bulbs in the correct spots and flipping the switch will allow us to use the curtain control. Opening the curtains reveals a huge mirror on the stage. We can use the controls off to the side to change the set decorations. Certain combinations will change the environment inside the mirror and will transport us to another place. This is an incredible usage of the mirror mechanic. It adds some flavor to this area. It expands it in a completely new way, even though there's only three small areas to explore here. Each area feels like its own little pocket dimension with endless possibilities past the bounds of which we can travel. In one area, we'll find a horrific tree of bodies, from which we'll gain a key to the stage office. The second area is an ancient library full of pages from archaic texts. One piece talks about mental programming, used by governmental agencies and possibly cults. Another talks about shamans who have the ability to kill with their mind. Another page talks about children of trauma splitting their brain in two. And the last page details telekinesis and how its subjects who exhibit symptoms of this power are normally female. There's one more area, but we don't have the handle for the controls, so we'll have to use the stage office key and grab it. Travis grabs it and we enter the cave, which we know from the note we read at the beginning of the theater holds Caliban. This is our third boss fight of the game, a large lumbering thing, a massive monstrosity using its hind legs to rush and jump at us. Same strategy as all the other fights, run away and shoot for a few seconds. Travis gains the third piece of the Floros. You need these, don't you? This story design gets a little repetitive around this point in the game. We go through the same thing over and over, and each of these little scenes with Alessa aren't really necessary, because we aren't learning anything new. She just shows up, gives us a scowl, and then Travis takes a nap. Travis finds a key to the Riverside Motel and heads there. On the way, we stop at the public record office and find some more interesting memos. One regarding Alessa's childhood and evidence of a cover-up on the fire at the house, saying that the fire was accidental and started in the boiler room. Travis heads through Andy's bookstore. Inside, we find a cardboard cutout holding an assault rifle. The man in the cutout happens to look just like Travis. Odd. There's a note that tells us the code for the cash register is the key to someone's Greenfield apartment. That code comes in use here, and we enter the numbers 2 one, and three into the keypad. This lets us head out of the back of the bookstore. Weaving through the general store, we find an ominous note about the butcher and head to the motel. In the reception area, we see a flashback of Travis and his father checking in. The note tells us that they checked into room 500. Travis finds a key to room 306 and a rolling calendar that needs a date. We find a room full of shoes, which could be a reference to Twin Peaks, and a wedding outfit laid out on a bed. A memo written by Travis's father states that he told Travis that his mother was dead to spare him the pain. In one of the rooms, there are strange pictures, Polaroids, and scrawlings all over the walls, and a note about the birthing of the god Samael. One big complaint that surfaced halfway through my playthrough was the camera angle. Silent Hill is known for its camera angles, and their use in the first few entries made the games much more atmospheric, terrifying, and represented the twisted world that we were entering. In Origins, they don't really feel as interesting or well-placed. Top it all off with the fact that the native control scheme makes the camera angles insufferable at times, having to reorient your controls each time you change angles. We find a note stating that the laundry machine is busted, and it tells us the exact buttons to push to fix it. 
In the maintenance room, we find an odd hallway with peepholes into each of the rooms. Inside one, we see a flashback of Travis's father. The calendar in front of him has a date circled, the 12th. We can see into the Polaroid room from here, and the butcher is standing alone there. At the end of the hallway, we find a key to the manager's office and a Polaroid of someone who died by shotgun. Heading through the open motel courtyards, we'll encounter two additional enemies, the two-back, which is two people fused together into one monster. The second is one we've seen before, the Caliban. It's now a common enemy and goes down a little easier than the boss, which was already pretty easy. Travis finds a memo about some travesty in room 500. We find a Redeemer revolver in one of the rooms, and heading into the kitchen, Travis sees the butcher torturing another enemy. We have our boss battle against him. This monster that's been built up throughout the game in the background, and he's incredibly easy. Just like every other boss in the game, he goes down by just walking away and shooting. When he goes down, Travis slashes at him with the Great Cleaver. We find another memo from Travis's father to his mother, cursing her for leaving him alone. One more subtle change I noticed between this game and the previous entries is the memos. In Silent Hill, normally there are memos scattered everywhere, and they're covering a wide variety of topics. Some of them can seem to be obscure and have nothing to do with our story at first glance. They may actually have nothing to do with our story and just work to build the world around us. Silent Hill Origins seems to do away with this. Most of the memos we find in the world are specifically relating to Travis and his situation. Sure, there's the occasional memo referencing Alessa or the power of the town, but those are few and far between. There's rarely ever a note that's sole purpose is just to establish the world around us or bring more atmosphere to the game. Travis finds a token by the pinball machine, and we hear a flashback about Travis asking his father for money to play pinball before leaving to go back to the hotel room. We find the laundromat and press the inputs into the washing machine, matching the note we found earlier. This gives us the key to the Cleopatra room. Inside, we find another Polaroid with a woman who died of snakebite and dropped through the hole in the floor. Downstairs, Lisa and Kaufman are finishing their affair. Lisa. Travis. You have a habit of popping up where you're not wanted, Mr. Grady. Isn't it time you left town? I can't. Try harder. We find a note from Dahlia to Kaufman telling him to hurry because their hold on Alessa is weakening. We head to the other world and find a jeweled heart, which we can crush with a vice, and find a wedding ring on the inside. It has an engraving that says, To my June bride, love forever Richard. Travis finds a note that reveals that Helen tried to kill him as a child. Heading back to the rolling calendar, we now have three different pieces of a date to enter. June, the month engraved on the wedding ring, the 12th, the date circled on the calendar in the peephole, and 1961, the date on Travis's lucky quarter. This gives us the key to room 500, the room Travis and his father were staying in. Heading to room 500, Travis sees his younger self walking the same path. We see his child self finding his father hanging from the ceiling. Richard Grady transforms before us, becoming the final boss of the game. I bet you can figure out how we defeat it. It goes down and the truth piece is on the ground. Alessa shows herself and we're in the storage area of the hospital. We find the final piece of the flowros on the ground. Here we have to assemble the demonic prison and once we do it, it opens up, exploding in the process. Alessa is back in the real world now, not the other world. She leaves the building and Travis follows. What have you done? You broke the spell. Now she is free. I just want to end this. I thought that's what she wanted too. I want out. Can you help me? You want out? Ha <laughs> ha! Far too late for that. We get a pretty gorgeous cutscene, especially for the time, of Alessa projecting her nightmare onto the town. 
Travis runs away and the entire town is enveloped in the nightmare now. We have a crudely drawn child's map to guide us, and we head into the antique shop. Inside we find a note on the origins of the Flauros, and head into the hole at the back of the room, just as Harry did in the first game. This time though, things inside are a little different. Before we head down the last corridor, there's a Silent Hill 2 reference with six save points on the wall. Travis makes his way through into the ritual room, and Alessa's body is on the table, still burned. Kaufman, looking especially like G-Man here, knocks Travis out. She's here! We need to begin this now! Don't worry, Dahlia. With him out of the way, she has no conduit for her power. Travis appears in the other world, and the imprisoned demon is standing in front of us, ready to fight. There's at least some mechanics here, as we have to avoid fire falling from the sky. While the mechanics of the fight are a pleasant surprise after the incredibly easy boss fights thus far, the boss design himself is awful. It's very of its time, a stereotypical demon, bright red skin. Nothing too crazy here. No stepping outside of the box or trying anything new, just big scary demon, ooh scary. Travis grabs the Flauros and it traps the demon inside. It appears in front of his unconscious body and seems to split Alessa's soul in two, causing the ritual to be stopped. Travis is now allowed to leave the town, and he finds his truck just where he left it. He gets in his truck and sees Alessa in the side mirror before leaving the town. I don't believe it. Harry, it's a baby. It's a girl. Go on. Hold her. Cheryl. We'll call her Cheryl. Half the soul is lost. The seed lies dormant. The other half is not lost. We'll use a summoning spell. Hearing her pain, it is sure to come. It will take time. We can wait. This was only the good ending for the game. There are two other endings for Silent Hill Origins. The bad ending of the game can be achieved by beating the game once and killing over 100 enemies. Travis is strapped to a bed in a sanitarium trying to get free. We see the butcher and Travis kneels on the ground while the butcher's face is overlapped with his. The UFO ending can be unlocked by beating the game and getting the room 502 key and unlocking room 502 in the Riverside Motel. Before Travis enters the room, a flying saucer comes down harboring an alien and a dog, just like the one from the Silent Hill 2 UFO ending and Travis leaves with them. Most of Silent Hill Origins extras come in the form of accolades that can be achieved after beating the game. Infinite Stamina, Night Vision Goggles, and the Tesla Rifle are among a few of the rewards that can be achieved. But what really happened in Silent Hill Origins? Travis Grady, a trucker, makes a shortcut through Silent Hill when making a delivery. In the night, Alessa jumps out in front of him, causing him to swerve. Alessa leads him to the building where her real body is burning, and upstairs, he finds a ritual in progress. Dahlia leaves just in time not to get caught, seemingly starting the ritual. Travis passes out and wakes up in the town, and heads to the hospital to check on Alessa. Inside, he's given the power to transport himself to the other world by Alessa. Travis defeats the lying figure in the other world and gains a piece of the Flauros. Alessa shows up and Travis wakes up in the hospital again. He meets Lisa Garland for the first time, and on a whim, he heads to the sanitarium. There, he runs into Dahlia Gillespie, who seems to have no concern for her daughter. While at the sanitarium, he learns that his mother was held here and that she tried to kill him as a child. He defeats his mother and gains a piece of the Flauros before heading to the theater. One day, Alessa snuck into the theater and the costume of the character Caliban terrified her, and her powers caused the actor to have a nosebleed. 
This monster is manifested in the other world and Travis kills it, gaining another piece of the Flowerose. At the motel, Travis learns that his father killed himself and he found him as a child, causing him to face his childhood trauma. With the last piece of the Flowerose intact, Travis puts it back together and Alessa regains her powers. Travis intrudes on the final ritual and cages the demon in the other world, which causes Alessa's soul to be split in two. Alessa leaves the other part of her soul on the road for Harry Mason to eventually find. Silent Hill Origins' story is an odd one, that's for sure. The entire game is really something that I'm conflicted on. It seems to be an ode to the original three games and takes inspiration heavily from those. Its story, slightly focused on Travis Grady and his realization of his past and trauma, mirrors that of James from Silent Hill 2. Its main plot, though, focused on Alessa and trying to tie up loose ends or make things more palatable for the average fan, takes great inspiration from Silent Hill 1. The entire game is made to represent and recreate the feeling of the first one. The biggest problem with all of this is that it's unnecessary. The first reason for going back to the story of Silent Hill 1 would be to clear up events, which doesn't need to be done. Silent Hill exists perfectly on its own. Going back and clarifying would only weaken the story and harm the game that does it. Half of the information we receive throughout Origins is information that we already know. The other reason to go back to Silent Hill 1 would be to try and recreate the atmosphere and success that that game had. This, in my mind, isn't possible, because the series thus far has succeeded, even with its failures, because it's always tried something new. It seemed like Origins did want to try something new, and it had hints of that in the background. The new mirror mechanic, which has its own problems, and Travis's backstory, which is only half new, but it feels the need to pad itself in the story and surroundings of Silent Hill 1 as some sort of safety, and that is its downfall in the end. If it were to wear these new changes on its sleeve, I could at least commend it for trying something new, like Silent Hill 4. But Silent Hill Origins just feels like rehashing things we've already seen before. Not only that, but Silent Hill Origins goes as far as muddying the waters for the first Silent Hill. It seems to change Alessa's burning into something purposefully caused by the cult. Alessa doesn't split her soul to weaken it and stave off the ritual, the Flauros does it. Not to mention all of the characters are completely foreign in this entry, Kaufman and Lisa in particular. These names and faces seem like a cheap use of the characters to garner interest from the fans, but this only serves to backfire. The story is also a little more in your face than before, and by the time Travis's story is revealed, we already know what's happening. Origins tells us everything rather than letting us figure it out on our own. There's a pretty popular theory that Travis is the Butcher, and that he's mentally shielding himself from his crimes, represented in the Polaroids across the motel. If this is true, then sure, it elevates the game slightly, but I don't think it forgives it of the rest of its sins. The game itself has its own issues, camera angle, controls, weird action-y combat, and cartoony animations. All of these things serve to make everything just feel a little bit off. It feels like we're playing Silent Hill, but something is wrong. You have all the pieces, an unknowing traveler with a troubled past, the characters we remember, the flowros, the fog, monsters, cults, but something isn't right here. On the other side of that coin, Silent Hill Origins is playable, and some of the puzzles are pretty interesting. There's some high moments in the game, good environment choices and interesting design, but all of that is overshadowed by the fact that I feel like I've done this before. Every game previous, even Silent Hill 4, felt new. Whether good or bad, it was trying. Silent Hill Origins doesn't really feel like it's trying as hard as it should be. Critics received the game well overall. Kristen Reed of Eurogamer wrote that it was basically an unapologetic homage to the first three Silent Hill games. Its story was criticized for being too obvious and predictable, though. 
At this point, another Silent Hill game had already been announced as in development, but we'll talk about that next time. Bye, Dad.